Hi, welcome to Talking Books and Stuff, the program that talks all about books and writing and stuff. Here's your host, Dennis Rimmer. Welcome back. It's Talking Books and Writing and Stuff. Dennis Rimmer here, on the line with us from southern Saskatchewan in the Regina area. Trevor Harriet, a naturalist, um, does a bird-watching type show on CBC Call-In, I think on Mondays, uh, on CBC Saskatchewan. Lots of books out there, award-winning books. So, uh, how you doing these days, what with all the stuff that's going on around the world? <laughs> Well, we're trying to keep keep uh, track of it, and, and uh, you know, like everybody else, we're learning as as we go here. They're making things up as we go. It's a learning process, definitely. The you know, it's I mean, it's interesting to see how the science changes every day or two. You know, the shift, the whole shift on whether it's a good thing to wear masks has been interesting. But personally, what's hardest is that we just don't get to see our grandchildren as much. You know, and we don't get to be to hold them in our arms. It's it's been but you know we're privileged, lucky people, I guess. So we've got a, you know a place we can we can shelter, and, and we've got people who will, who will deliver food for us, etc. So we're doing fine. Everybody's healthy. That's good, and same here. I know what you're saying. And uh, just before we get into a bit more details about your life and times, um, I was thinking earlier that. It seems that nature is on a bit of a rebound, and then I'm reading stories where people are seeing more eagles and things like that. So, is that a, a safe thing to say these days? Well, elements of it are, I think, are enjoying the absence of humans at in busier places. I don't think there's so much of an effect of that in places like Saskatchewan, um, you know. But you know, I've, I've seen seen the same images other people have seen uh, and heard the same stories about the cormorants returning to the canals of Venice and fish being visible, which is mostly just from the water settling a little bit. The fish were probably always there, but the water got churned up at the boats. You know, and images of elk returning to beaches uh, on the uh, Pacific coast in the U.S., beaches that usually would have been very disturbed by human beings. Um, so I, I, I think it's, it's always interesting to, to consider that, but it, it's more interesting just to look at the larger things like the pollution levels dropping and the amount of, you know, uh, greenhouse gas emissions from the slowdown of industry and transportation. That's that's probably a bigger phenomenon that's giving the earth a bit of a breather. And it seemed that it didn't take more than a couple of weeks before... You know, places like Los Angeles, let's say, are, are smog-free almost. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, we've all looked at those photographs before and after. Yeah, right. <laughs> we're talking with Trevor Harriet, a naturalist, a writer, author. Um, tell me a little bit about your background, please. Uh, Where did you grow up and get your education, things like that? Okay, well, I, I, uh, I'm a born and bred Saskatchewan person, although... Uh, my parents, both both from you know Saskatchewan farms, had had moved to Alberta in the fifties. I think in the first oil boom, you know, they were out there. My mom, mom and dad met each other there, but then moved quickly back to Saskatchewan right after I was born. So I was actually born in Edmonton, uh, but we were living in the oil patch at Drayton Valley, uh, and so then I've lived my whole life here. And and you know, my formative years. We're in the eastern Coppel, uh, in the area around Estrazi and Tantalon. A lot of relatives on my mother's side in the Tantalon area. So that's my earliest memories and places where I think I first developed an interest in, you know, nature in general, but also just kind of became imprinted on those landscapes of valleys, coulees, aspen bluffs, and sloughs. And then uh, by the age of 10, we moved to Saskatoon because my dad got a job at the potash mine. Uh, west of Saskatoon, and I uh, lived there from the age of 10 right through university, then I moved to Regina, and this has always kind of felt more like uh, closer to, to my home landscape here, because we're near the Capel Valley and so on, yeah. And what kind of, you went to university, was that at the U of S in Saskatoon? That's right, I'm a graduate from the U of S in, in English, English literature, I graduated in 1980. 
1980. Oh, okay. You're one of them yeah. young guys. <laughs> <laughs> I graduated high school in 1967. Oh, okay. But that's only 10 years or so um, ahead of you, I guess. Yeah. So what got you interested? You said you've always been sort of a naturalist, and that's a product of your upbringing, you think. Well, like a lot of prairie people, I had, although I didn't grow up on a farm myself, I had lots of relatives, grandparents, uncles, cousins, and so on, who lived on farms, and we would visit them. And, and then, as well, my father, because he, he grew up uh, mostly in um, the Emma Lake area, Christopher Lake, where they had a, a, a bush farm there. And, you know, he, he loved the lake and, and canoeing and fishing and hunting. And uh, so we did a lot of that when I was young. And he taught me how to, how to hunt respectfully. And those were some of my first experiences and encounters with the more than human world. It was, uh, you know, down the barrel of a gun, but mostly just walking in nature. And because and, uh, you only actually get to aim your gun couple times a day or a few times usually you're just out walking and looking and I quickly started to figure out by the time I was 20 years old that it was the walking and the experiencing and the sensory experience of being out there more than killing things that really made me want to do it and, and that you could you could find times year round to it and not just wait for hunting season <laughs> <laughs> right you can go out any time of the year um, mm. when did your writing career kind of first take off well because i studied english in university and i uh, was introduced to some writers there that really kind of let me know that you could write about this part of the world not just about england or the american south that narratives you know could be about this part of the world and also you could write non-fiction that was in a way kind of literary i discovered that in my last couple of years of university and got interested in writers like wallace stegner and barry lopez and uh, mostly American nature writers, to be honest. And that really lit something in me. And, you know, I decided that I wanted to, I, I put that in my mind as something down the road that I wanted to be doing, and but I needed a way to pay the bills. So I started working at SASTEL as a corporate writer, um, a technical writer, first of all, and then writing public affairs writing. And I spent my, my working years, my career really there. And it was a, a way for me to, pay the bills and still be able to take time off, get leaves of absence and get some arts board or Canada council funding to take time off to work on a, on a book or two. So I started that in 1996 with my first book. Um, I got a, an award from the city of writers, um, city of writer, city of Regina writing award, <clears throat> which allows you enough time and a bit of income to, to work on a, on a first book. Or on a book, so that got me started in '96, and I did the research that summer for River and Dry Land, <laughs> and then published it in 2000. So that was how I got writing books. Before that, I was writing magazine articles, a couple for Canadian Geographic, and some newspaper work in my spare time too, just kind of trying to practice my chops and and learn how to tell stories in in ways that would engage people. And what was your first published work where you got some money for it? <laughs> Oh gosh, <laughs> that's hard to remember. I was writing for a, a little new, uh, prairie newspaper put out by um, the the monks at the Benedictine Abbey at, at Munster, St. Peter's Abbey. And it was called the Prairie Mester, and it just folded a couple of years ago. I wrote a couple of newspaper articles for them. That might have been my very first paid paid uh, newspaper stories. Well, yeah. So that's yeah. A... or or it could have been for Briar Patch. I wrote a couple of things for Briar Patch back in the eighties too. Um, here, in, here in Regina. And your first book came out in 2000? Yeah, and that was River in a Dry Land. And uh, yeah, that was that was my first book. And it was a, a bit of a prize winner, to say the least. Yeah, I was, I was overwhelmed and very happy with the way that went. But, you know, to be completely honest, Dennis, the publishing world, the writing world, book world was so different then. That was just before the internet really started to change publishing in, in a powerful way. And in, in a good way, because now it's much more easy for people to get published. The publishers are, aren't just gate, the only gatekeepers. You can self-publish in so many different ways now. But it has flooded the market. 
uh, which again can be good because there's just wonderful variety of books out there. But at the same time, it's harder now to get your books noticed. And so in a sense, back when River and a Dry Land was published, it was kind of easier to be, you know, to get some attention to a new book and for it to, to succeed and to make a bit of a splash. I, I just think... You know, if it was published today, it probably wouldn't have the same effect as it did back in 2000, to be honest. And you have a website. There's a quote on your website from uh, Bill Richardson. Lots of people know his name from CBC, and he lives in the Vancouver area, I think, in the West End. And he says, yeah. Trevor Harriet writes and writes beautifully out of a passionate, almost proprietary concern for the landscape. Is that an accurate summation, do you think? <laughs> um, well, I, yeah, I really haven't got much I could say about that. It's, it's very humbling, those kind of quotes. We all have to do this, right? I'm not very good at self-promotion, but the publishers and, and other people want you to, you know, in the book industry, they want you to put that kind of stuff on your website. Make sure you have a website and so on. So I've got, I've got a few of those quotes there. I, I can't really pass judgment on them. <laughs> Speaking about books and writing, um, did you read a lot as a kid? Well, I'd love to say that I was a voracious reader, which I hear I hear writers say all the time. I wasn't, right? I was a, I was a kid. I wanted to play basketball and be outside and and do other things. I mean, I did read. I remember some of my earliest the earliest uh, books I read. It was really not until I got into high school and I had a a very good high school teacher, English teacher named Mr. Michalak, uh at Holy Cross High School in Saskatoon. Then I got inspired and, and saw how literature was more than just a pastime, but that really in reading and uh, studying literature, you are immersing yourself entirely in the history of ideas, in in culture, in history of civilizations, and uh and anyway, and so it's it, you know it's it's very rewarding, and, and and it's more than more than just something you do like knitting or playing a sport. It's it, it can inform your life, touch your soul, add poetry and, and beauty to to uh, to your days. You know, and so just discovering that I think in high school, then discover then deciding to go on to university and study was uh, was formative for me, I think, and, and got me thinking that writing about the prairie and writing about prairie people and culture and nature was a possibility. Trevor Harriet is with us today, uh, author of River in a Dry Land. His first book came out in 2000, which is 20 years ago when we think about it, but it doesn't seem that long ago to me. I was only 50 20 years ago. So uh, what are your other books? Maybe you can give us a rundown of what you've got out there. Okay, after that, my second book came out in 2004. It was called Jacob's Wound. Um, and it was, it was a kind of a, a journey through literature and religion and history, looking at uh, our, our relationship to indigenous peoples in the New World and in the prairie here in particular. And uh, sort of the contrast between the hunter-gatherer way of the world and the, and and the colonizers' approach, you know, which is more agrarian and agriculture-based, and how that that shift in the trajectory of human history has extracted us out of nature and out of out of a healthier, more sustainable relationship with nature, and not not in a way to suggest any particular solutions, but just to look at it and and, uh, and see what it has meant for for us and, and the struggles that we have now here on the prairie in particular. Um, so that was my second book. And then after that, I wrote a book mostly on grassland birds, um, but really about the whole of our, our native prairie and its, and its um, decline here on the northern Great Plains. And it's, it was called Grass Sky Song, uh, Promise and Peril in the, gra- in the World of Grassland Birds. Um, and that would that it come out 2007, I think. Um, after that, I wrote, I wrote a book called A Road Is How, which was uh, following uh, a three-day walk out on the prairie 
Um, again, just sort of question, questing and looking through some spiritual questions and cultural questions around nature and being a prairie person here. Uh, and then following that book, uh, I wrote a small, a really small little book, which I think is one of the most beautiful books we've, I've created or been a part of. And it was called um, Towards the Prairie Atonement, published by the University of Regina Press. And I'm very proud of that little book. Um, that came out what, four or five years ago. And then a couple of years ago, I worked with photographer Branimir Jetvai and produced um, a book that I guess some people would call a coffee table book, although coffee table books don't usually have that much text. This one has full essays in it, uh, uh, several good long essays, but it's accompanied by the beautiful grassland photography of Branimir Jetvai. Um, and so that's my most most recent book uh, that was published by Cotto Press a couple of years ago, and now they've unfortunately gone bankrupt. And uh, so Branimir is uh, securing those those book copies of the book and uh, looking for distribution options right now. Yes, that just happened a while ago. That was quite a blow to the publishing industry, let alone the publishing industry on the prairies. I mean, they were major players, yeah. pretty much. Yeah. yeah, it's sad, and it's part of that that greater change and, and transformation that's going on in the whole publishing industry since the advent of the internet. And I first experienced it with my first publisher, went bankrupt. I had a really good Canadian publisher for River and Dry Land called Stoddard Press, and they, they went under only three, four years after that book came out, um, you know. <laughs> and uh, then McCall and Stewart picked me up, and then they, they had a big change and were kind of bought out. Um, by Random House, so everything is is changing, and there's a lot of consolidation going and concentration of power from the big international publishers, and then I think some of the smaller publishers are going to continue to struggle. And of course, Amazon um, is a very big player and has a big influence over what is happening uh, to books and to the royalties and the, pr the profitability of publishing for the publishers. Well, I know it's it's a strange landscape and sort of like everything these days, it's sort of uncharted territory at times. Um, mm -hmm. Other than your own, do you have a favorite book that you go back to maybe more than once? Yeah, I mentioned Barry Lopez earlier. I, I love all of his writing. Um, I was hoping I was going to get a chance to meet him a couple of years ago. I was invited to a very small gathering of writers and uh, professors of sort of equal literature in Texas and Barry was goes to this every year and I was hoping to meet him but he, he fell sick and didn't, oh, didn't no. show up but I had a good time there anyway um, but I, I often go back to his Arctic Dreams I read that book a lot um, Peter Matheson also has great influence on me so I sometimes read his his writing books like Snow Leopard are really important to me um, and then well, I mentioned Wallace Stegner as well uh, certainly, I certainly read Wolf Willow and bits of it, you know, off and on, and uh, really appreciate that he was not just a writer, but he thought of himself as a as a conservationist and an activist, and and uh, he, he would get he would use his skills as a writer to uh, engage the public to you know save a national uh, treasure of some one kind or or another in the West. Trevor Harriet is with us today uh, talking about the books and birds and other things like that. Um, you do a segment on CBC, I think it's weekly, out of Regina. Uh, how did that all come about, about birds and things? We, we've uh, Birdline has been going for about 20 years or more now. Uh, I, I continue to love it. It's, just, it's, it's a privilege to be able to listen to people and hear their stories and encounters with birds in their lives. It, it actually isn't uh, once a week. It's probably more like uh, nowadays every every month or two. Okay. Um, it's a little bit er erratic. Right. Um, but anyway, it's they just they were looking for someone to do this a few years ago, and I can't even remember. It's been so long, <laughs> but I, it seems like I've been doing it forever. Uh, I've gone through two or three different uh, hosts, working with uh, different people at CBC over those years. But it's yeah, it's always. It's always fun, and you get you get interesting calls and quirky little stories. I, I I love the way prairie people, particularly rural people, notice things. You know, you get calls from farmers on their 
trucks, people looking out their 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 uh, window at the shelter belt in their farmyard, or or somebody out driving on the highway, driving grain to the terminal and seeing seeing some birds, something you know, a hawk doing something, or a strange looking duck, and they want to tell the story. It's it's fun. What are we seeing in? Uh, well, we're up here in Radisson, Saskatchewan. So, what kind of birds are we seeing in our backyards these days? Right now, yeah, well, pretty much. This for... a, it, yeah, this this spring has been a little cold and delayed, hasn't it? So mm-hmm. we've got this effect of um, some of the birds that would have moved through a little quicker, like the juncos and American tree sparrows, have been really, I think, hanging out waiting for some good weather. So they're. They hit our yards about three weeks ago or more and are still there. I've still got juncos today, probably 12 or 15 of them that I saw at my bird feeder. So uh, I'm not going to mention the, the resident birds, like the nuthatches and the woodpeckers that are there year-round. But in terms of what's moving through right now, of course, the hawks started moving a little while ago. So we've got lots of red-tailed hawks. The first turkey vultures have been seen. The... Uh, Coopers and sharp shin hawks are coming through. Saskatoon and Regina have both got pairs of peregrine falcons now have arrived in the city and are setting up nesting. People are seeing bald eagles already on their nests. I know of a pair here near where we are. And, uh, you know, so there's been a trickle of, of uh, wetland birds start to arrive, but there's just not much open water yet, is there? Not really, so no. We've got, no, so you've got the big groups of snow geese flying over and uh, the Canada geese have been here for weeks. We haven't had a really good migration of ducks yet, just just a few species. So that's still yet to come. There's majority of the spring migration is still ahead of us. And it's going to, when we get some warm weather here, the back pressure of all those birds sitting somewhere south of us is going to come flooding in with, uh, I think, a pretty dramatic push of birds here pretty soon. Um, speaking of backyard bird feeders, is there something we should be feeding or not feeding the Typical average, yeah, for backyard birds. I always recommend people to use a, a first of all the black oil sunflower seeds for seeds, and then as a as a second sort of uh, type of feeder to to get a nut feeder where you just buy these bird grade nuts in a bag and get them at you know anywhere you can you can find good selection of, of bird food. And uh, if you put a nut feeder up, you get chickadees, nuthatches, and woodpeckers right away, and you don't have to worry too much about the sparrows and so on. But then having the black oil sunflower seeds, all the other birds, the ground feeding birds, and sparrows uh, especially will will really enjoy that. And, and we're we're hitting a time here in about a week or two where we'll start to see the more a broader range of the the uh, sparrows. You know, we'll start to get white throat sparrows, white crown sparrows, Harris sparrow, Lincoln sparrow, song sparrow, and all those are going to be coming through our yards pretty quick. So throwing seeds on the ground for them is probably the best strategy. A lot of people will ask me about what's the best kind of feeder to get, and I say, well, the, the ground. Okay, <laughs> Just yep. put them on the ground somewhere. You know, that that will attract birds, especially if you're having trouble attracting birds to your yard. Start with something on the ground. Then you worry about buying feeders and hanging something up. Perfect. Good advice. Good place, perhaps, to wrap things up here. But you do have a website. Maybe you could... Uh, Give us the uh, information on your website. The website is just, it's simple, trevorharriet.com, www.trevorharriet.com. And, uh, yeah, it, I used to run a blog. I still have a blog that's on the Internet, but I don't do it anymore. Um, and it's called Grass Notes, Trevor Harriet's Grass Notes. But there's a ton of stuff in there on our grassland you know, our beloved grassland here in, in Northern Great Plains and all the, the birds and uh, the people, too, who, who are connected to it and the need to, to conserve it. Because it doesn't get, I don't think, enough attention and respect in our environmental, you know, issues in Canada. Uh, TrevorHarriet.com. Now, Harriet is H-E-R-R-I-O-T. Is that right? That's right. One T H E R R I O T. One T. Got to remember that. Okay. Was well, you got a favorite bird, by the way? <laughs> I always say it's the one in front of me. <laughs> Looking out my window here, can't see one right now. <laughs> but uh, you know, I like the swallows. I, li- I like swallows because of the way they fly. Oh, right. Okay, Trevor Harriet, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much, and uh, happy birding. All right.
right. Thanks, Dennis. Take care. Appreciate it. Thank you for visiting with us today. This is Talking Books and Stuff with Dennis Rimmer. Contact him at dennis at talkingbooks.tk. Thank you, and may all the good news be yours. Oh, and don't forget to check out his book, The Great Canadian Notebook, available across Canada and at amazon.ca. Oh, oh.